Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is your girl Mitzi, and this is Mitzi. Let's think about it. Today, we are thinking about unicorns. Yes. I know. I know this is a topic that we all really needed to break down and understand what is going on with unicorns. So luckily for me, I have Walter on my show who has written a book about unicorns. Yes, the truth, the mythology, everything in between, all of the goodness. So I guess to just rip off that Band-Aid, Walter, what got you into unicorns that made you want to write a book? When my daughters were very young, they kept on asking me to tell them a story that was my story, not a story from a book or a story from a legend. So I created a story, and because they were young, it was a story about a unicorn. Well, this story had some legs to it, and I started writing out the story for adults, because any story involving traveling with a unicorn really should be an adult story if you think about some of the myths. Uh, so um, I did a lot of research and I got the novel published, um, The Garden of the Room for the World with Dragon Ball Publishing. Uh, but the publisher noticed that I had put in a lot of research into uh, the background, the backstory, the mythology, etc. And so after a few years, the publisher approached me, hey, Walt, would you like to write a companion piece? Uh, maybe something about unicorns. And I said, really? They said, yeah. I said, okay, this, this will be fun. And it turned into my COVID project. And so right to the middle of COVID, there I am going after my work day, going downstairs each day and writing. And eventually we came up with this. Um, I learned a few things along the way, but uh, unicorns, it turns out, are real. And I was flabbergasted when I started. I did not know that. Um, back about 13 to 15,000 years ago, there was a very, very large beast, Lasmatherium, a uh, distant relative to the rhinoceros, except the horn grew out of the forehead, not out of the nose. And this thing was huge. It was the size of a, a mastodon, which is bigger than an elephant. And uh, it used to roam um, Europe and Asia. And we have a photograph, uh, sorry, not a photograph, a, um, a cave drawing from in one of the caves in France from somebody who saw a unicorn or a lasmatherium about 13 to 15,000 years ago. And the fun thing is that if you do the research and you read the ancient Persian or the ancient Greek descriptions of a unicorn, they are describing a lasmatherium. And that's just kind of amazing. And even, and even more amazing, although this one boggles my mind, um, 800 years ago, Marco Polo went to India, and he was either drunk or he was describing a unicorn or a lasmatherium, because his description of what he saw is either a very drunken depiction of a rhinoceros or a spot-on depiction of a lasmatherium. And to think that they might have survived until 800 years ago is just mind-boggling. Of course, that's pure speculation. We have no evidence other than uh, Marco Polo's descriptions. But strangely enough, his, while he was a bigot and a fool, his descriptions of things tend to be surprisingly accurate. And so I had a lot of fun writing the book and um, learned an awful lot about... Um, how uh, those um, stories, uh, depictions of unicorn by the Greeks and the Persians got turned into the myths that we all know and love today. That's crazy. I love that you were able to find the truth out of the myth. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And that's that's the that's the beauty of it. And I, when I was reading just the title alone, I was like, he must have found something. He must have found something that the world didn't really know to be able to write this book. And that was the key, I think. Yeah, and there were some people, scholars, who knew this, but it had never reached the uh, popular imagination. Everybody thinks a uh, unicorn is an imaginary creature, often a horse-like uh, being with a horn on the forehead. Um, and in childhood, you think of unicorn as cute and loving, um, and this thing was huge and ferocious and, fr frankly, darn right scary to mm -hmm. our ancestors. Um, and, and the fun thing is that the early myths of unicorns depicted as huge and scary, um, uh, though amazing. Um, the, uh, 
the, uh, I think it's the Talmud, or it could be the Torah. I'm not exactly a scholar, and I haven't read my own book in about a year, so I'm forgetting. Uh, has the unicorn as one of the uh, the four animals of the tabernacle. Uh, we have the unicorn showing up in uh, ancient Coptic legends. We have the unicorn showing up in um all sorts of odd places before sometime in the middle evil era, um, Hildegard of Bingham got a hold of uh, the idea of a unicorn being a beast that could cure poisons. And uh, she was a brilliant woman who did so many amazing things that people listened to her even when she spouted nonsense. And this was a bit of creative nonsense on her part. But um, from that, uh, the idea of a unicorn completely changed. And so you started to see unicorns becoming allegorical to um, Jesus within Christianity, while before it was uh, a, a, a demonic creature that would drive people into the underworld in Coptic myth or in, um, um, and associated with, uh, let's see, um, the, the cult of Ishtar in, um, or Rishkagul in ancient uh, Mesopotamian mythology. And of course, one of the creatures of the tabernacle in Judaism. I had no idea about that. To be honest, I had no idea that that was even a thing that they even related unicorns in that way in so many different religions and cultures and, and so many different type of centuries. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, just, it just shows that and they they needed to switch the perspective of unicorns because to have this ferocious beast is not willing to possibly cure diseases, you know? So maybe, maybe that's through another reason why they did. I don't, I don't obviously I'm, I'm far from knowing any type of knowledge on this, but I think that's kind of crazy how they flipped it to be yeah. this pink, fluffy marshmallow looking <laughs> you know cuteness that everybody loves because i just finished buying a marshmallow um not a marshmallow uh, a unicorn bath set for my niece oh, and cute. yeah and i was just like hmm i wonder it's they probably don't even look like this because then they made they made a movie i don't know if you've seen it but um the new flash movie actually has unicorns as a very vir like vicious creature wow. they they demonstrate the unicorn not to be like it's what people imagine it to be and i think it was kind of cool because it was a dark very tall big you know dramatic being and i was just like man imagine if they were really that big but the way that you described it you were just like yeah they were big they were bigger than big they were bigger they were than what people couldn't even imagine and the fact that beca they became extinct, it they were just like, yeah, this is too unreal. We can't put this together and call it a unicorn. Pass it along, and now it's in the imagination and and the myth era of our of our lives. You know, so I'm curious, what's the biggest myth that you heard that was just like, goodness, this is crazy. Um, if you read the biography of Genghis Khan, okay. um. He was in the process of moving his armies across Tibet in order to invade India. And he comes across the unicorn standing in his way. And he approaches the unicorn and the unicorn bows and does homage to him. And he um, asks for his, his advisors, what should he do? And they say, the unicorn is telling you do not cross into India. Uh, go elsewhere. It will not be good for you if you cross into India. And so Genghis Khan, who conquered everywhere else he went, turned his armies around and went back across the mountain passes through Nepal and did not attack India. And that myth just blew my mind that um, Genghis Khan would listen to a unicorn, which um, in uh, Asian mythology is believed to be a messenger of the gods, and turn around and not attack India. Um, oh. Breathtaking. And the big question is, exactly what is it that he encountered? That was it in the last material? Or perhaps was it one of the sheep that um, people in Nepal they um, alter the sheep's, um, the way the horns grow from the sheep so that they fuse together into this very, very uh, solid horn. 
And this this is done to, even today. And uh, did he come across one of those and think it was the uh, messenger from the gods? Unknown. Wow. That's true. That's but, crazy. Oh, my goodness. I'm loving this. It's like the History Channel. <laughs> Just right in front of me. I love this. Uh, I think this is such a great topic because I think when more people realize the fantasy that we created just makes that that statement that sometimes we allow ourselves to believe into to what's fantasy so it's acceptable into our hearts and our environment and into our lives in reality it's just sometimes it's like we need to accept the fact of the truth so i love the fact that you wrote this book and that you're sharing it to the world i mean i guess my next question is <clears throat> Do you think people will start like seeing unicorns in a different way? Or do you think unicorns will always be this marshmallow pink fluffy thing for all of life? I think for the moment, um, we're going to see a lot of pink fluffy marshmallow unicorns marketed to our children. Um, it's it's a very, very, become a very, very powerful metaphor for innocence and joy. And uh, that's something that uh, young children just eat up. So why stop that just because they have a history of being something dangerous and dark and deadly? Um, let our children have those uh, pink fluffy unicorns and give them big hugs upon their birthday and that doesn't stop us from knowing the uh, the history of them. That doesn't stop us from understanding that when our ancestors saw them, they weren't saying, oh, how cute. They were saying, oh, damn, I got to get out of here fast. Because if that thing's running at me, I'm in trouble. Yeah, that's true. I like the way that you put that, you know, let the innocence be where it's at in the children and allow it to be how they portray it. Because once we become an adult and we face reality and we have our own hardships and, you know, our own struggles and we do we start to do our own research because, you know, we as adults seek that fact, you know, that having that that factual to guide us and to continue forward so once we acknowledge the fact that oh they're actually very ferocious vicious humongous beings then you can have a little bit more respect for those you know for what they were you know just like you said they were seen in so many different ways in so many different cultures and so diff in different centuries so no matter where you're seeing it from you have some type of respect for what it is yeah, this way, when you see a unicorn on the top of the state house in Boston or on the royal crest in Scotland, or if you see a unicorn um, in uh, Japan or China, you understand that um, people were uh, doing homage to something that was awesome and amazing and powerful, yeah. uh, breathtaking. Um, in the East, a messenger from the gods. In the West, a um, harbinger of um, something true and virtuous, uh, something that only the purest could find. Um, and that's, by the way, where it became something for children, because we mistakenly think that only our children can be pure. Yeah. We forgot to challenge ourselves to be pure of heart as we grow up into the world. And we've just given in to the idea that none of us are worthy when the core of the unicorn message is that we are all worthy mm -hmm. if we just seek for one. And part of that comes from um, in Western Europe, there, there came a point where you had this silly notion that the only people who could seek out and find unicorns were virgins. And very few adults um, past a certain age are virgins. And that was never part of the unicorn myth until very, very late in development. Um, it was it initially was about purity, but that was, of course, after it was something that you did not want to see. So the transformation of the myth from this is a dark and dangerous creature that the uh, devil sends to drive souls into hell um, to uh, a creature that will cure poison, to a cute creature that only the pure can seek out, to a creature that you have to be a virgin. And the ultimate proof of your virginity is that a unicorn will place its head into your lap. 
is a very, very striking um, change in mythology. And it really has a lot to do with um, uh, twisted values in Western society that um, thought virginity was some sort of marker of purity when yeah. it's just a marker of an experience. Yes, I like the way that you said that. That's very true. It really is a marker of an experience because innocence can be at any age, really. It just depends on your mindset. You know, anyone's mindset can be tainted at any age, you know, it, and people don't realize that. Yeah. And and that's why if, if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or any other social media, you'll see periodically I'm posting up photographs of beautiful landscapes. And with that, I'll, I'll post a comment, still haven't found a unicorn. And part of that is, you know, I go out into the world and I see beauty around me. And why wouldn't I find a unicorn in the midst of that? Why stop looking? Yeah. I may be old and grizzled with a with a gray beard, but I can still search for the impossible and yeah. still uh, look for it amongst the beauty of the world we live in and have fun with it. Exactly. Have fun with it. I think that's the beauty of unicorns. It just not only does it represent, like you just said, purity, innocence, you know, that virtue, but it also gives you that chance to be creative. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't exist then, or anymore, then it allows you to be creative and, and allow it to be whatever that you want it, want it to be, you know, and I think having that creativity and that imagination is what truly what we need to hold on to. Because like you said, you can find a unicorn in any landscape, in any situation. It just depends what you want to label your unicorn to be, you know, mm -hmm. at that at that given point. So I think that's truly something, truly something special. And I'm curious, are you writing anything else? Or are you working I've, on anything else? I am. Uh, first of all, I've got a new novel coming out in February that's got nothing to do with unicorns. It's now okay. <laughs> uh, Johnny Tanner and the Goddess of Love and War is um, a fun, fun, fun um, detective story. Um, okay. And I've got um, that same publisher that put out the, uh, the unicorn books mm -hmm. uh, has asked me to write two more. So I'm doing something about... Well, if you were to time travel back to the 13th century, what would it be like? Um, what would it look like? How would people act? And so I've got two books in process that's meant to be uh, take history, which most people think is dry and dreary and all yeah. about who killed who and what battle when, and turn it into something fun. So if you were walking through Timbuktu in, this, in 1250 CE, what would you find? What would it look like? What would it smell like? Yeah. So history can be a lot of fun if you just put a little bit of a twist onto it. And exactly. and so that's what I'm trying to do with uh, those two books there. Um, and um, obviously, I'm very, very excited about this one. Um, something completely new and different for me. Um, it's a story about a detective who um, has an unusual way of solving mysteries. And one night he comes home, um, his, uh, he hasn't been making good progress on the case he's working on, and there's this beautiful woman in a bloodstrained dress in his apartment. And she's reminding him of a drunken promise he made to help her, which he can't remember because he really was drunk. And so he takes the case and... It's a wild ride from there on. I know. I I was reading a little bit when um I got the the little the the description of everything. I was like, wow, that seems interesting, because she didn't she force him to to take the case kind of as well. She kind of twists his arm. Yeah, like him. she forces him, and I, yeah, that's what the part that drives me crazy is because she's not the type of person that would even seek help. From the description, from from my, I don't want to give it away too much because yeah. I want people to go get the book because it is, does seem interesting. I, yeah. I, I believe I'm, I'm, I'm even going to get the book because you awesome. got to get those, those twists. You know what I mean? You got to yeah. get those books that have suspense and thriller because it makes you think, makes you wonder. And like you said earlier, sometimes when you have that shift of perspective, it truly mm -hmm. changes the way that you perceive it, the way you understand it, the way that you just everything going forward. It's like a. a a ripple effect in your life 
So yeah. the fact that you're changing the way that people see history and trying mm -hmm. to refocus on on everything else that people really do focus on when 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 they are living, I mean, that's that's what we need again, you know. And as an author, I mean, how hard is it for you to tap into that when you go into your writing mode, or is it just like mm, one, two, three, easy peasy? <laughs> Uh, there are some days where the uh, everyday wears on you, and it's uh, difficult. I'm fortunate that I have um, a delightful partner with my wife of 34 years, uh, Margot. She's um, she rejuvenates me, a smile and a hug, uh, puts joy back in my heart, and uh, that allows me to to sit down and just um, play. Um, when writing, when it's done well is, is just let's pretend uh, but it can be let's pretend about some um, amazingly different things it can be a, let's pretend we can go back in time and visit Constantinople in the um, 12th in the 13th century or it could be a, let's pretend that um, unicorns uh, still walked the earth and uh, the eldest of them needed the help of a young woman in um, Brittany or it could be let's pretend that this incredibly gifted woman is suddenly very desperate and reaching out for help to the only person she thinks who can help her. And he really can help her, but it's going to be a wild ride. Mm -mm -mm. Um, and, you know, it, it's part of the fun that I have in, in my life is I haven't stopped playing. Words, words are fun toys and stories are a great way to just kick back, relax, and have a good time. Yes. Yes, I absolutely believe that. It's a way to be free. You yes. I mean? It's a way to be free where there's literally no consequences because you're the one doing everything. You're the one, you're the puppeteer, the one, the one that's causing every death, every illness, every life, every joy, every every experience in the book. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful moment to be an author and to create possibility and and because you don't know it could be possible you don't know and maybe another universe and another plane and another whatever it could possibly be but that's the beauty of imagination but just being creative in the moments and just allowing that what if to escape in paper or escape on your computer or just escape in general i think that is truly a, a gift that authors do have and when you do it right man you can you can change the lives of many many people Many. Yeah, when you do it right, you're sharing a bit of your soul with the world. And and so authors get a little bit apprehensive. How is this going to be perceived? Um, are people going to enjoy this? Are people going to hate this? Because it's a part of you that you're sharing. And so far, it hasn't been published yet. That's February 21st. But uh, I've gotten a couple of reviews uh, from places like Kirkus Reviews. And wow, they got it. They understood what I was doing and they enjoyed it. And that's, that's just the most wonderful thing in the world. When you share a little piece of you within the world and somebody gets it. Oh, is that wonderful. I, mm -hmm. I recommend it for everybody. And it could be a, mu a mu musician a musician playing music, or it could be an artist drawing a painting, or a sculptor, or um, somebody who knits making um, a sweater or blanket. Any one of these wonderful gifts, when you share them with each other, uh, and you get joy in return, this that's so rewarding. It is. It truly is rewarding. Well, I have to start wrapping up the show and it's so sad when I have to start wrapping up the show because it just gets really, really good. And I feel like I truly can talk to you about so many things, Walter. You have a great perspective. I might have to bring you back on for next round, right? And think of something else because goodness, you have a great perspective that really, truly makes you shift about unicorns about writing about history just about certain things in life that you said was so oh my goodness mic drop like you know what i'm saying there were great great points so i guess if you can share just one last words of wisdom what can you leave my audience off with to just think on some more i'd encourage everybody to be open to the possibilities um that they'll encounter in their lives to keep their the fight hard to keep their hearts and mind open the way they were when they were children uh, the world can 
are really shut you down. But if you close yourself down, you're missing out on so much. Uh, and stories and uh, myth, myths can are there to help you pull yourself back out of those walls you build around yourself so that you can rediscover the joy and love and amazing uh, world we live in. I like that. I like that a lot. Wow. See, you guys, Walter just keeps throwing on the good information for us. You know what I mean? Just so for us to keep on thinking. Goodness. You guys want to know more about Walter. I have his lovely photo with the unicorn book along with it on my website. You can check it out. I have his website, <laughs> excuse me, where you can just, just click right there and you can find all the goodness that Walter has to offer to the world. All of the accesses, books, everything, everything that he has to offer to you guys. Go check it out so you guys will continue on thinking. I promise you. So that's it. That's our show. Always keep thinking, y'all. Bye.